Welcome to our fourth coffee chat this year. It's great to have all of you join our conversation this month. My name is Leanne Swanson, and I'm the CEO of the National Center for Healthcare Leadership. And I just wanted to briefly welcome everybody um, to these uh, bi-monthly conversations. We always have a great turnout and for a great conversation. And today is no exception. We have a wonderful conversation on why U.S. healthcare institutions develop international strategies and some expert panelists who are going to have a conversation about that. So welcome. I'm going to turn it over to Alia Ibrahim, who's our manager for our USKIP program, who's going to moderate our session today. And uh, I'll turn it to you now. Thanks. Thank you, Leanne. Hi. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's coffee chat. Uh, before we get started, um, I just wanted to mention that if you're interested in joining um, additional events hosted by NCHL, um, we have three upcoming webinars that are open to the healthcare community. Um, so the first webinar um, is going to be on July 26. It's the changing landscape of international commercial payers and how stakeholders are adapting. Um, and then the next day, we're going to have a National Center for Healthcare Leadership Town Hall about remote work uh, is here to stay, what now? And then um, finally, um, on August 6th, we're going to have a webinar transforming the payment experience for international development and advisory programs. Um, so please check out our events calendar if you're interested in joining um, other uh, National Center for Healthcare Leadership events. We look forward to having you join us. So for today's uh, coffee chat, um, I just wanted to mention, you know, as you know, the coffee chats were launched in a uh, celebration of National Center for Healthcare Leadership's 20th anniversary this year, which coincides with the launch of our new mission statement, which is dedicated to advancing healthcare leadership and organizational excellence by building diverse, inclusive, and collaborative relationships in the U.S. and abroad. So today's coffee chat is going to focus on the abroad part of our mission and highlight healthcare institutions that have international strategies. And as many of you may know, uh, Many of NCHL's members are institutions that include academic health systems, medical centers, and healthcare administration programs. So our discussion today about international feature in academic health system and healthcare administration program that both have international strategies. So I'm very honored and pleased to present our speakers today. Um, our speakers are Dr. Charles Wiener, Professor of Medicine and President of Johns Hopkins Medicine International, and Dr. Robert Hernandez, Distinguished Service Professor and Director of the Executive Doctoral Program in Healthcare Leadership in the Department of Health Services Administration at the School of Health Professions at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So we're honored to have them join us today. And I would like to give our distinguished speakers a very warm welcome. And they will carry most of this, the discussion today. So um, I will turn it over to them. And to start us off, I would like to ask them both to introduce themselves by telling us a little bit more about their role at their institutions and also to share a little bit more um, about what their institution does. Dr. Uh, Charles Wiener, we'll start with you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I can't, I have no idea how many people are out there and uh, hopefully it's just more than my mother that's listening right now. Um, but I, I'm Charles Wiener. I've been, uh, I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician. I've been on the faculty at Johns Hopkins uh, for about 30, a little over 30 years, and I've had many roles. Um, most of my experience, I started out as a basic scientist, but then I um, evolved more into a medical education roles and health and training roles, and eventually became vice chair of the Department of Medicine and director of the OSER Internal Medicine Training Program. I did that for some number of years, and then uh, on behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine International, I moved to Malaysia to help open a medical school using the US model in Southeast Asia. Spent four years doing that, came back in 2015 and joined Johns Hopkins Medicine International, which was already at that time over 15 years old. And in 2018, I became the president. I'm still active clinically and educationally uh, in addition to, because I think those complement my roles as president of Hopkins International. I'll stop there as an introduction. Thank you. Dr. Hernandez? Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Bob Hernandez. I'm part of... Uh, faculty at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, the UAB has been around for about 50 years. Our Alabama system has, was founded in 1831, so we're a relatively newcomer to uh, uh, the Alabama system. We have about 30,000 employees here at, at UAB, 
over 20,000 involved in the healthcare system with over 1,500 physicians. So we're kind of a large medical enterprise. I've been uh, at UAB for uh, over 40 years now, former chair of the Department of Health Services Administration. Uh, I headed our doctoral program, PhD program for 15 years, and now have uh, started the uh, executive doctoral program about a decade ago. I've been working globally for 20 years, and I'm responsible for our, our global health initiatives within the department. We're involved predominantly in leadership development. We began in the caucuses uh, working in um, uh, Armenia as the former Soviet Union uh, uh, collapsed. We went in to help uh, with them with their educational curriculum. It was interesting when we went in, uh, they used to train physicians to, to run hospitals and they shared the book that they used uh, to train the physicians and half the uh, book was devoted to the role of the Communist Party in running a hospital. So there was a lot uh, that, uh, of fertile ground for us to help them with their curriculum. We also worked in Eastern Europe a, a, a fair amount, in Ukraine, et cetera. Uh, we've been involved as Charles and I were talking in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we've also organized uh, educational trips for our executive students, over 30 of those uh, looking at healthcare systems in other countries. We think it's important for executives here in the US to understand what's happening globally uh, because we can potentially bring back ideas from other countries. So again, that's kind of uh, my involvement in what we're doing here at UAB. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. Um, so can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit um, more about what kind of work your institution engages in internationally currently? Yeah, I could do that uh, kind of quickly, I guess. We, t we look for, you know, especially within our department, look for international partners to help them improve their, uh, their uh, uh, educational processes. For us, it's mostly focusing on management and leadership. But certainly the School of Medicine, Dentistry, Optometry, Nursing also are, are involved internationally. Uh, with them, they're trying to improve the clinical skills in other countries around the world. And we have very active programs uh, uh, to uh, uh, meet those needs. Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Johns Hopkins Medicine International um, does internationally? So Johns Hopkins Medicine International is kind of the global arm of Johns Hopkins Medicine, which is an enormous entity, um, about 8 billion, 8 billion US dollars in, in total revenues and stuff like that. But, our, it, but it, I, I think the simple answer is that we, we try to export our mission. The, that's the clinical care, the research and the education in any way, shape or possible uh, overseas. And, and we've been doing this, actually, it's interesting because uh, the foundation of Hopkins uh, itself, it's about 125 years old, but in the early, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we actually, Johns Hopkins, uh, our Dean, William Welch, helped form the Peking Union Medical College in China. So we've been active internationally for 130 years, um, 125 years, sorry. But uh, so the, the, the short answer is that whatever is mission-based projects, whether it's clinical care, operations, research, or education, that's the kind of stuff that Johns Hopkins International expedites on behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine overseas. Uh, and we have examples of all those. And it ranges everywhere from uh, knowledge transfer consultations to named affiliations to joint ventures. Uh, again, all of them related to the Johns Hopkins mission. Thank you. So we know both of your organizations have an international strategy. Can you tell us why your organization developed an international strategy and how the international strategy has evolved over the years? Dr. Wiener, go ahead and you can start us off. So uh, it's like I said, I think part of our heritage is, is to be international. And, and obviously if you, if you walk around the Johns Hopkins campus, uh, you see people from all over the world their students, residents, patients, faculty. So it, it, it's, it's the logical extension of what we do. Um, as far as our specific strategy is concerned, we have two divisions within Hopkins International, a patient services strategy, which focuses on patients coming to the United States for their care, for whatever reason, and we expedite and coordinate, help coordinate that care, and a global services division, which exports Johns Hopkins medicine expertise to um, affiliates or uh, collaborators overseas. 
Um, again, the strategy derives on, on exporting the mission and improving healthcare worldwide in a, in a kind of a, you know, teach the village how to fish type strategy um, with the notion of trying to raise the, the, the level of healthcare everywhere, which is, I think, what everybody is trying to do, whether it's in your own local community, whether you're, your region, the country, or, or internationally. Uh, so I think the strategy is to improve healthcare throughout the world. And the, the goals and objectives are through uh, mission-based projects and uh, when necessary, caring for patients at our own institution as needed. Thank you. Dr. Hernandez, let's hear from you. Uh, why did your organization develop an international strategy and how has the strategy evolved over the years? Well, it, it, it's been interesting. Um, again, our institution is 50 years old, but uh, we were involved uh, you know, we, almost from the beginning in, uh, in Asia, I know, especially uh, School of Dentistry, helping um, uh, uh, create uh, clinical programs uh, uh, in that area of the world. We also used to be involved, uh, and you had asked earlier about why, what's happening with our um, international patient program. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting that uh, in the 1980s, we were heavily involved in, in terms of attracting international patients and thought that was an important part of what we were doing. We had John Kirkland, who's a prominent uh, 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 cardiothoracic surgeon, who was an important magnet for bringing, uh, attracting uh, patients both nationally and internationally into UAB. Orthopedic surgery was also uh, an important part of that activity. And while we had some high visibility patients who came in from the Middle East and there's stories that uh, about, uh, uh, about that, the focus was primarily on Central and South America. Uh, we had several Spanish-speaking em employees. Uh, one in, uh, was the daughter of a famous general or prominent general in Latin America who helped facilitate uh, patient flow into Birmingham. But over time, it became more difficult for us to com compete with hospitals in Houston, uh, New Orleans, and Miami for those uh, patients. Uh, it, it was easy for families and patients to, to get direct flights into those cities, whereas Birmingham was a several hop uh, uh, a destination away. In addition, our occupant, occupancy levels were so high, above 95%, that it just wasn't as attractive for us to be involved in international patient flows. So uh, while we um, do many other things in terms of improving educational processes and, and training of clinicians and healthcare leaders around the globe, uh, we're not as actively involved in um, uh, inpatient care as we once were. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a follow-up question to that. Um, so were there any lessons learned on, you know, uh, evolving your international strategy? Can you share with us some lessons learned? There were a couple of things I would suggest. Uh, one on the international uh, uh, patient flows and the second one in terms of uh, our more positive aspects of uh, visiting other countries and, and working with uh, healthcare leaders there. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, part of it is patience, uh, certainly, and building trust over time. To develop long-term relationships, it requires trust. Uh, our, you know, uh, people here in North America tend to be very um, time-driven and thinking about trying to accomplish things immediately. And yet, when we're working internationally, we found it takes uh, a great deal of time to develop uh, personal relationships and keep those things flowing. The other thing I would say that we've learned is that healthcare systems must blend with the cultures uh, in which they operate. It, it's critical uh, that we, when we work with, for example, leadership development programs, we don't try to export what we're doing in, in the U.S., but try to blend uh, our leadership development uh, programs to the cultures in the countries in which we're operating. We think that's critical for success. Uh, we don't want to be the ugly American who's exporting what we think are our values but we have to embrace the values of, uh, of other countries. Uh, so uh, we're also proud of what we've learned from um, other countries. And I'll talk about that later, if you'd like, in terms of visits to Sweden and the Netherlands and Germany and what we've taken away from there that we think would enrich um, uh, what we're doing here in the US. Thank you, Char uh, Dr. Charles Wiener. Do you have any uh, lessons learned that you could share with us? Oh, I, I can speak for about six hours on lessons learned. <laughs> um, but I would summarize by uh, saying that, and again, so remember that 
our our organization is not um, we're not a grant driven organization. Many organizations are, so our school of public health is largely grant driven. We are uh, more uh, client relationship driven. So most of our clients come to us or we go to them, but most of our, many of our clients come to us asking for collaborations and stuff. And I think the, the most important lesson we've learned is finding good partners who match up with your goals and expectations. And then really importantly, and aligning expectations. Um, the, the problems that I've had with my entire life, frankly, have been when I do not have the same expectations as somebody that I'm dealing with uh, and that we're talking in cross paths. Uh, so I, I would say that no matter what your, your, um, your goals and objectives are, uh, starting out with making sure that everybody is aligned with the goals and objectives and the, the methods to translate those goals and objectives into actions, to me, that would be the, the most important lesson learned. And I also think that um, I think coming as a clinician, I think we have an advantage I have there is, and I'm not a businessman, um, and and I, I I I have to I have to understand business people. But as a clinician, we we come up in a collaborative, multidisciplinary uh, fashion. That's how we best care care for patients, particularly in the ICU. So I think uh, fairness is another um, core value that I would say is that. Look, I, and, and it relates to what uh, Dr. Hernandez said, is that understanding your, your partner, but I think trying to be fair, um, not trying to exploit other people, either financially or clinically or in any way. I, I think fairness is, is a doctrine by which we all should adhere. So I think those would be the two things that, um, that, I, that I, the lessons. And again, agreeing with Dr. Hernandez, being a, a good listener is key to develop any kind of international relationship. Um, I do think that there are some things that we do need to export to other countries. And sometimes you have to be a little bit insistent upon that. So for example, quality and safety, patient engagement. Uh, many of those are things that, that I do think that our country is ahead of much of the rest of the world in. And I do think that those are values that we should export. Fortunately, in our case, most of our clients that come to us have already come to that conclusion and are asking for our help so that we don't have to be the bulldozer, we can actually be the collaborator. Thank you. And Dr. Hernandez alluded to this um, a little bit um, earlier, um, but my next question is, what is the strategy behind having or not having an international patient program at your institution's medical center? Um, Dr. Wiener, if you wanna kick us off with that question. So we obviously do. Um, and I think it, it's part of our mission to provide good clinical care. And there are places where we clearly can provide clinical care that is not available in other places. Um, it, we're, uh, we have access to enhanced uh, technical, intellectual, procedural uh, opportunities where, and, uh, where, uh, we, where, where people can come to us. And I also think that uh, in the chat, someone asked a question about China. And China is interesting, but I think we've had many patients come from China because there are trust issues in China. There have been a number of scandals in China about the quality of the medications being given. And again, I, I'm a big fan of China, but I think patients come to the U.S. and Hopkins, the U.S. often and Hopkins some of that time because they trust us. I think we're very transparent. I think we've made great, we, and I'm speaking broadly in the United States, uh, we've made great um, advances in patient engagement and, and patient service. Um, just the whole transparency issue is, is a, a great example. So we believe that it's part of our mission. Our clinicians love caring for international patients. Have, caring for international patients does help us too because it helps our education, helps our training, helps our, our diversity initiatives. So there's a lot of good reasons to do it. Um, and, and like Dr. Hernandez said, we're a little bit more accessible than, than Birmingham. Uh, because we're close to Washington, D.C., so it's not that hard for patients to get to us. Thank you. Dr. Hernandez, do you have anything to add about why your organization does not have an international patient program? Yeah, I went through some of the issues, but I think that the takeaways from that, too, if, if uh, uh, an organization is thinking about entering into the um, international patient services market, there's some things that we need to think about structurally from a kind of a market uh, perspective. Uh, one is uh, to attract patients into to your facility. 
it's important that you have a clinical service or a health system that's highly ranked nationally. Uh, that's important in terms of, again, it, at least from uh, a beginning standpoint, <clears throat> having patients trust that uh, the quality of what you're doing is, uh, is, um, is on par with other uh, nationally competitive uh, services here in the US. The direct flights, I think, are important. Uh, I also think you need an infrastructure within uh, your country, within your facility, and within some of the countries that in which you may be working to facilitate that flow of patients. Uh, patients just don't wander in. It's important for you to have a way to work with them and uh, develop uh, uh, relationships with other countries. You need to have access capacity so that you can uh, handle the influx of patients. I think you also need to have a willingness within your provider uh, area, not only the clinicians, but the support staff, dietary, et cetera, who are flexible and willing to provide the amenities that are not part of the way we normally provide care here in the US. One of the stories they tell in uh, when we were working in the Middle East was a crown prince was uh, receiving a, a, a surgery here at UAB and his uh, um, royal family uh, rented the entire wing of the hospital for the royal family. And part of what their expectation was that they would have meals served on, on China with, with uh, linen, cloths, et cetera. And uh, you know, one had to be accommodating for, for that kind of uh, activity. Now that's uh, out of the um, ordinary, but it certainly happened. The other issue that, that came up, and, and again, these are kind of inside stories, but uh, the, the um, members of the royal family were used to tipping people uh, when services were provided. So if a uh, um, uh, orderly or a di dietetic worker provided the meal, they might get a hundred dollar tip. So you can imagine how one would fight uh, to provide those services um, uh, in that setting. So again, I think it's accepting uh, uh, ambiguity, really there are going to be complexities that go with handling international patients. And, and I also think you need a champion. Uh, if you're going to start a service, a champion for new initiatives, uh, because it takes a lot of energy and excitement to, to generate a program if you don't currently have uh, international activities ongoing for patient care. I, I'm just a little bit shocked to hear that every patient at UAB doesn't get uh, glass, china, and, uh, and, and tablecloths. <laughs> I, uh, I, I understand. I know that's <laughs> not the way it is in Hopkins, right? Oh, yeah, every single patient. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to keep our costs down and put it in <laughs> areas. So anyway, good point. Yeah, the, the breakage problem is a huge part of, of our costs. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, so a couple more questions. Um, just want to ask, how does having an international strategy advance diversity, equity, and inclusion at your institution? Dr. Hernandez, do you want to kick us off with this question? Sure. I, I think that's an interesting one, and I uh, asked that of my colleagues uh, here over the last several days uh, as we're working uh, internationally. One thing I, I think it does for us is uh, it was a realization as we worked uh, in uh, various countries that all healthcare providers have a common interest of working for the same outcomes. Uh, we may have come from different cultural backgrounds, but we're all concerned about improving the quality of what happens for the patient. And that's been important for us as a starting ground as, as Charles was talking about having common values and interests uh, moving forward with, uh, with working together. Uh, I think it also helps us in terms of gaining an appreciation for the beliefs of others. Uh, if you're working in another part of the world, then uh, again, we can't uh, uh, enforce our values and beliefs on them. It's important to work with them. You know, it's also in terms of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. It was interesting this past week, uh, we were uh, had some webinars with uh, colleagues in New Zealand, and they were talking about their healthcare system. And one of the, uh, the, the indigenous population was a board chair and was talking about their health system and how it's structured so that the indigenous population is an integral part of their, uh, I would call it national health service. And at, at the same time this week, we had one of our doctoral students do a dissertation looking at the Indian health service. And you think about what we have done in terms of providing services for the, for the Native Americans is quite different from the integration of uh, the, the local population into the health services in other countries. And I think we can take that away as a value that would benefit 
us all here in, in the US. So those are some of the, the major things. And again, uh, there's some highlights in terms of things that we've learned in other countries uh, in terms of how care is organized that we found interesting, but I'll stop at that for now. Thanks, Dr. Weiner. No, I, I would just agree with every single thing that Dr. Hernandez said, and I, th I think you know, uh, and 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 just I would say it's great for our institution to have people of all different shapes, color, everything walking around our hospital. It, it highlights our mission that we're there to help the world, uh, and and then I just think that the whole notion about understanding the, you know, the, the world is flat and understanding a global perspective. I mean, look at the rise of semester abroad programs in colleges and stuff like that. I mean, there, there's just so much that can be gained by, by understanding uh, out of sight of your little bubble of your little world. It goes without saying. It's great for the institution and it's great for all the participants in the institution and it winds up being great for the patients too. So I think it's, I hate the expression win-win, but it is. Thanks, Dr. Wiener. Um... So we'll open it up to questions um, to the audience now, and we've already received several. Um, so just to kind of um, round off the win-win the statement that you made, Dr. Wiener, there, there was a question in the Q&A um, basically stating that pursuing an international patient service program is a no-brainer. So why are some top health systems hesitant in investing more in this space? Well, I think Dr. Hernandez covered that beautifully. I think there's 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 pros and there's cons. I don't think I I do not think it's a no-brainer because if you do it requires you got to spend a lot of brain power on setting it up properly as he articulated, and there are also obstacles to doing it that are just sometimes out of your control and sometimes within your control. So I think it's an institutional strategy decision that has to be a conscious decision and not a passive decision. I thought he articulated that beautifully. That's my. Thank you. Anything to add there, Dr. Hernandez? Uh, no, not really. It, it, it is interesting, though. It, we we <laughs> tend to be um, thinking of ourselves in North America as the, the, the hub of, of, of uh, all knowledge. And, in, and I especially think about that in terms of international patient flows. And yet, as you look at other countries, uh, there are many places in the world that are also involved in competing for these international patients. Uh, I've been in, uh, uh, in uh, London, and uh, as you may know, uh, HCA has owned uh, the Harley Street Clinic for a number of years. And they have a lot of patients from the Middle East that come in, especially for oncology services. And it's interesting to, to see, uh, that was with the CEO a, a couple of years ago, and see the uh, Bentleys pull in with uh, uh, the the, the uh, families from from the Middle East uh, coming for care in London. So it is a highly competitive market. In in Germany, uh, there's a lot of focus on a number of hospitals there. In Russia, uh, the Russians uh, are frequently going outside their country for care. Uh, we were visiting last week uh, virtually with a, a large hospital in Malaysia. Uh, and they, 35 to 40 percent of their patient revenues are international, uh, which is an incredible number. Uh, but they have a low cost structure. Certainly they, they have neighbors like China and Singapore and Korea and Japan that, that flow to, to their country. But the, interesting in their top 10 were also uh, Ireland and the UK in terms of where their international patients uh, originated. So this is not just a simple way to to open the doors and they come, um, you really have to work hard to develop these networks and relationships to make things successful. Appreciate hey, uh, hey, Alia, uh, Mark Wen uh, asked, put a comment in the chart in the chat early on about China, and I, can I, 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 I just want to, so I am very pro-China. I've spent a lot of time in China, and we believe, and I think China. Uh, recognizes the need to improve their healthcare systems in many ways, their, their workforce, their training. There's a lot of aspects that make China very, very attractive for collaboration with the United States. And I also find them great people to work with. They're very, uh, they're, they're just very, very motivated and their clinical care, the, the number of patients they care for there is just simply astonishing. Um, but what worries me greatly about uh, China right now is not so much COVID, because I think we're gonna get past COVID, although they're continuing the lockdowns, but Right now, politically, the only thing the Democrats and the Republicans agree on in the entire world is antipathy towards China right now. So I'm really nervous about how our country starts to deal with China. 
Uh, typically, healthcare was immune to some of the political antipathy, um, but we are starting to see it overflow a little bit, and and that wor that worries me greatly. So I'm hoping that as a country we can come to appreciate China as a medical colleague, uh, but I'm I'm very nervous about about that right now. Thanks for uh, covering that, um, Dr. Hernandez, Dr. Weiner. Um, you know, we're at the top of the hour, um, so I just wanted to give you a, a moment, just any any final comments to add. I know we had um, a bunch of questions. We unfortunately weren't able to get to all of them. As we suspected, 30 minutes would be fast. So as we wrap up, I just wanna, um, you know, uh, offer you a, a chance to say any final comments before we uh, close the, the session. Dr. Uh, let me just quickly say, uh, it's been a pleasure to, to participate in this. And, and Charles, I've been enjoying hearing your conversations. I'd love to go offline sometime and discuss your experiences. I'd, I know I'd learn a great deal from what you've been doing. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share this panel with you. I'll say ditto. And, and I just wanna congratulate NCHL on all you're doing and for putting these things together. And uh, I, think, I think it's great that people talk and it's, it's, it's not only great, but it's also a heck of a lot of fun. So thank you very, very much. And Alia, great job in organizing this and running it. Thank you very much. Um, it was an honor to have you both as our guest speakers today. And I just wanna um, let the audience know, sorry that we didn't, didn't get to all of your questions, but if you do wanna learn more about NCHL and continue to engage with us, um, we're always happy and eager to take uh, you know, suggestions and please uh, do visit us um, on our website. And uh, we hope to see you at our future events and uh, webinars. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Alia. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> it did go it did go very very fast too, by the way. Thank you.